Hi, today I'm going to talk about stress relaxation. Specifically, how should you analyze stress relaxation data that you obtain? That seems obvious. You just put the data into whatever software you use to calibrate the material model, and then you work with it. But when it really comes down to it, there are some really tricky parts to it. And specifically, what I'm going to focus on is the preload time. That it, in stress relaxation, I have a specimen here. I pull on it to a certain strain, and then I hold that strain constant, and then I measure how the stress relaxes. My question is really, how important is it to know exactly how fast I loaded this specimen to that final strain and then started measuring the relaxation? Is that something that's important for the calibration? And if so, how should I really think about that? It turns out that that's actually very important. And I will show you today how you can analyze that, how you can figure out what is going on in, in the problem like this. And I will use M calibration as an example of a tool that can be used to investigate this and better understand that some of the really challenging parts of a simple problem like that, like preload time, why would I care? And why it actually can make a tremendous influence on your results. So this is also a side a purpose of this demonstration is to show you how you can do this kind of investigation using M calibration in a very quick and interesting way. So, so the first step here, is I'm going to generate the stress relaxation data using M calibration with a known material model. So that is the, the data that I'm then going to go try to fit a material model to. And by generating the data in a known way, I can then go back and uh, see if I can come back to the original material model that I used to generate it. So that's how I'm going to check what is important and what's not important in this case. So. Let's get started and first generate some relaxation data. So I have a window M calibration here. So there are different ways you can generate experimental data, so-called uh, experimental data in a controlled way in M calibration when it comes to stress relaxation. The first way is to uh, first I will um, select a viscoelastic material model that I'm going to work with. So I'm going to just pick for my example here a abacus hyperelastic viscoelastic. I want to use five prone series terms. I'm going to use a Neo-Hookian hyperelastic model. And uh, M calibration warns me that I selected a material model without any experimental data. That's OK for our example. And here are the parameters that are uh, selected by the software. Now, what I'm going to do is I want to figure out how this particular material model will behave if I pull on it to 10% strain in 0 0.1 second and then hold the strain constant. So one way to do that is to create a virtual load case. I don't have actual experimental data, so I create a virtual load case. I'm going to use an uh, I want to use an engineering strain of 10, and I want to pull it to that in 0 0.1 second. So that's a strain rate of 1. And um, that's the first step. So it's loaded to 10% strain. I'm then going to add another segment. This is the stress relaxation segment that I want to study. I'm going to say engineering strain rate should be zero. And I'm going to do that for a certain amount of time. Let's do 1,000 seconds. I'm going to set the time stepping in a, a specific way here. So I want to have the minimum allowed time increment 10 to the minus 5, perhaps the maximum 1. And I want to start with 1e minus 3. That will give me a lot of data points. I save this, and I'm going to call this um, stress relax um, segments. I can now run this in our calibration. We'll see what the stress looks like. Uh, it goes up and down this way during tension and then relaxation. I'm going to change this value here to 0 0.5 instead of 0 0.9, so it doesn't relax so much. So this is my material model. Um, I'm going to now uh, go ahead and plot this a little differently. I'm going to plot stress versus time, which is typically what you plot in stress relaxation. So it drops, and then it goes like this. But I want to plot on a logarithmic x-axis here. So see that the stress goes up, and then it relaxes in this way. So to generate my, my so-called experimental data from this material model, I can just export this particular prediction here. So I'm going to save this prediction as engineering stress. I'm going to save it to file. And there it is, called Untitled Stress Relaxation Segments. 
I'm going to go in in the data tab and load this specific file we just exported. Here it is, untitled uh, data like that. And it read it in for us. And we have time, strain, and stress. Uh, what I want to do is I want to get rid of some data in this file now. So I'm going to select the, the top stress point here, which is the start of stress relaxation. I'm going to select all the rows before that by pressing Control shift up arrow and delete. So here's the, um, the time versus stress data. I can get, get rid of the strain column because we don't need that when we do stress relaxation. So I'm going to remove the selected columns. I have now a column that I'm going to call time, and I have a column that I'm going to rename to engineering uh, stress. So here's my uh, predictions from this linear viscoelastic material model. I can save this file now. This is my master experimental file that was generated in a controlled way. So I know what material model generates this. I'm going to read in this data file and see how we can fit to this. So I'm going to call this uh, generated uh, data relax. And here it is. I can clear this window and we can go back here. So there is another way one can generate the actual data that goes in here. I'm going to show you a second way to do this with the same material model. I'm going to deactivate this. I'm going to create another load case. But this case, I'm actually going to create a stress relaxation load case directly. So I go into the data tab. And I create my load file here. It's going to pretend I have experimental data. I'm going to say 100 rows. And I want to two columns. The first col uh, column should be time. And the second column in a stress relaxation test should be stress. So I say engineering stress here. And then I'm going to specify what times are you interested in. So I'm going to take 1e minus 3. The last one, 1e1 1 3. Then I'm going to interpolate between these two endpoints. Uh, and I want to interpolate in a logarithmic way because I have, I'm covering a lot of different strains here. So here's my, my so-called pretended uh, stress relaxation experiment. I don't have data for it, but I have the strain that I want to follow. But I can create a load case from this now. And if I click on that, M calibration will select automatically a stress relaxation segment. I say, um, I want to go to 10% strain, and I have to specify this is the feature I'm interested in. How much does the preload time influence the results? So I'm going to pick a small number like this, and then I is going to I will call this uh, stress rel relax. So here it is. This is my stress relaxation case. I run this one time, and we had an error. Uh, so this is a feature that uh, I forgot, but we need to fix that here. So I can say edit this. No, here's my file. I'm going to have to make this start from zero. So let's make this column start from zero. So at time zero is where the start of the stress relaxation test occurs. At that point in time, there should be um, a certain stress, which we don't have here, which we don't need yet. We're going to generate that. So I'm going to save this to the load case clear this table and go back here. Now I can run this, and it should give us the stress relaxation response. Um, to simplify the graph, I'm going to get rid of the, the so-called experimental curve, which is not really valid here. We just had zeros there. So I'm going to open this uh, plot style, experimental curve, no line. So we get rid of the line for the solid. Let me get this. So this is another way we can generate the, the, the stress relaxation response for this uh, particular linear viscoelastic material model. I can save this prediction here to the file, and there it is, and I can read it in too. So that was step, step number one. Okay, step number two in, in our study is to take now the experimental file that we generated, that we know exactly comes from a very specific Prony series linear, visco linear viscoelastic material model. I'm going to try to find a linear viscoelastic material model by matching it to that data. I'm going to calibrate my linear viscoelastic material model to the data set we generated. And then we can see if we get back to the original model. So I already helped myself a little bit here by reading this in. I have a load case here. It's a stress relaxation load case. And I have specified 
the specific file we generated in step one. So I read that in, here is my stress relaxation segment. And um, uh, I say that this occurred at 10% strain. And in my first example here, I say that the time to reach the, the preload strain was 0 0.1 second, which is exactly what I used when I generated the data. So in this case, I should be able to recover the original linear viscoelastic material model from the calibration to this data set, because it's the same data that we are basically reading again. So, so see if that works. One can, um, I'm gonna have, I have my solution here. So I'm gonna, let's keep this here and I can see if I can get it again. So here's my, my already calibrated solution. I can, the way I did this, where I can perturb these parameters, say by 20%, so I have the same material model, but, but not with optimal material parameters. It's offset. I can now try to calibrate this material model to this uh, experimental data that really we know where it comes from. And if we do this right, we should get back the parameters here that was used to generate this file. So again, stop this pretty quickly here. It converges very rapidly, as you can see. And if you may remember that in the original model, this one had a value of 1. This had a value of 0 0.16 or something like that. And this was 0 0.5. Um, when I ran this a little longer, the numbers that I got were these. So you see the error, the animal fitness is super low. In other words, we can get back very well to the original model when we use exactly the same conditions to calibrate. All right, so let's try something new. What I'm going to do this time is I'm going to have the same experimental data that we know how it was generated, but we're going to change the way we understood it. So we're going to pretend now we didn't know that this particular stress relaxation test was loaded in 0 0.1 second. We're going to say, well, we don't know what it was. So let's try. Let's assume it was, took one second to, lo uh, to load it to the uh, strain. Uh, at which we started the stress relaxation test. So in M calibration, I specify the time to reach the target strain here as one second, which is not what it was, but let's see how much that influences the results in the end. So I select that there, and then I can um, perturb my parameters. So I have a, a, a random set of parameters here that I want to find using that assumption that it took one second to reach the preload strain. And then I can just run the calibration from here like we typically do. In this case, it will take a few seconds and that adjusts the prony series parameters, the hyperelastic parameters, etc., and tries to fit the results. Um, to save time, I'm going to jump over to my uh, already calibrated results. So here's the best calibration I can come up with. See, the NMAT fitness is still very good. So even though it, it, I assumed it took one second to preload it, in, in real life it actually took 0 0.1. We can still match the data pretty well. And here are the predictions. But we now see some serious differences. We can already now see that the C10 term here is 50% larger than what we had in, when we generated data. So there's a huge error already here by assuming it took one second when it actually in reality took 0 0.1 second. That just comes out of this calibration approach. That is not good, obviously. Let's try a third case. So in the third case, I am assuming that the preload time is taking even longer, 10 seconds. I didn't know what it was. Someone gave me some experimental data. I assume it took 10 seconds to reach 10% strain. I'm plugging that into my calibration, and this is what will happen then. I can, uh, per first, I perturb my parameters to start the calibration from a sort of a random starting point. I'll run it from here a little bit. And if we let this run for a while, we will see um, that the calibration will get pretty close in this case too. I'll save time by switching over to my saved results, which is this one. I just loaded this saved one here, and the error is 0 0.196. That's then a 0.2% error. Very good fit. But look at this now. If I assume that the preload time was 10, when in fact it was 0 0.1, the best fit gives you a C1 value that is close to 10, which is an error that's 10 times larger. The stiffness is 10 times larger than it should be. That's tremendously bad. That's 1,000% error. 
clearly the preload time can have a very large influence on the calibration itself. So to explore this a little bit more, let's take a look at these three cases again. All right, so this is the first calibration we did where we assumed that the preload time is indeed uh, 0.1 second, which was used during the generation of the experimental data. So now I have generated three virtual load cases with uh, tension here, and I'm going to simulate these. These are the predictions. The solid lines are actually predictions with the original material model that was used to generate this uh, master material model that we're working with. When I calibrated this model to uh, the data that was generated with it, I get the following results. We we'll see that taking the model, generating data, reading in that prediction and calibrating to the prediction gives me back to where we started, or at least very close to it. So this is a proof that this kind of idea works. And as long as we know the preload time, we're in good shape. We can use that data to calibrate our material model. Now, let's go ahead and see what happens if the preload time, we didn't really know what it was. Say we assumed there was one second, when, which is 10 times too long. What happens then? Here are the results for the second material model that I calibrated. It was calibrated just like the other one, but I had an error in the preload time. And uh, we see, as I mentioned earlier, we have 50% error in the preload time. How does that translate to stress strain predictions? So here we can see uh, the prediction of the really uh, slow strain rate is still really good. At the really long times, we have a good prediction. But at high strain rates, we get an error that's very large. You can see that the NMAT fitness is 21. The, the, the green and the red predictions are way off the experimental uh, data, which is, in this case, it's not really experimental, it's the predictions that we want to get back to. Again, illustrating the importance of having the correct preload time. So let's finish up by looking at the third case. So here's the third load case, which was calibrated with a preload time that was quite wrong. And we see that if we try to predict the monotonic tension tests, we can get an error that's used ridiculous, ridiculous error, simply because we didn't know what the preload time in the uh, stress relaxation experiment. So let's summarize what we learned. When you get stress relaxation data from a lab, it could be your lab or someone else's, usually they just give you time and, and stress. And they tell you, well, the strain was 10%, 5%, whatever strain per strain. But they don't always tell you how fast it took the test machine to reach that strain level. And what we have shown here today by doing this uh, test using M calibration is that that can be really a big problem. If you don't know what this preload time was and you assume it is something and it wasn't that, you can get very poor predictions in your material model. You basically, in the material model, will capture the wrong behavior. And there is a way to sort of tweak this a little bit, and that is you can remove some of the initial data points and focus on the tail end of the stress relaxation data and give a longer preload time in, when you work it with it that way. And they can remove some of the errors at least, but you really, really need to know the preload time if you want to calibrate the material model to stress relaxation data the way I talked about it here today. Um, I hope you found this useful and let me know if you have any questions.